Good afternoon. Uh, right now we are going to start on uh, a converter which is an isolated DC-DC converter which is known as dual active bridge. So a dual active bridge is also a DC to DC converter and it comes under isolated uh, converter category. But uh, what happens in this particular case is we are going to have uh, a DC source which is going to be converted into a high frequency AC with the help of an inverter and that is going to be transformed into a, a higher or lower voltage with the help of a transformer. So this is a high frequency transformer and what comes out here is uh, stepped up or stepped down high frequency AC. Now this is going to be again converted into uh, um, uh, DC with the help of something like a rectifier. So this is again there is a full bridge circuit which is going to convert that into DC. So uh, there are um, uh, basically two converters which are coupled together with the help of a high frequency transformer in the case of a dual active bridge. So that is the reason why we are calling this as dual bridge, two bridges together. So we are going to have an inverter on one side and rectifier on the other side. Both of them are going to be full bridge. So if we want the roles to be reversed, so if we want this to work as an inverter and this to work as a rectifier, that will allow again the power flow in the opposite direction. So the power flow in the opposite direction is also possible depending upon how we are operating these two converters. So uh, one thing we have to realize is that uh, when a power transfer between one AC source and the next AC source takes place, how exactly what governs the power transfer between two AC sources, this we need to understand first before everything. So let us try to understand that that is power transfer between two AC sources. Let's first try to understand this particular aspect. So this is very, very commonly taking place in power systems. So we are going to have something like a sending and voltage on one side. So let me call that as Vs and that is going to be connected to the receiving end th through a transmission line. So let me call the reactance of this transmission line as excess, and we are going to have this as the receiving end voltage. So this is how a simple uh, power system is represented in the form of uh, an equivalent circuit diagram. So let me call this as VR, and I'm going to say that this is probably lagging behind the sending end voltage by an angle delta. So I'm going to show this as minus delta. So here we are calling Vs as the sending end voltage and Vr magnitude as the receiving end voltage. Now what we are going to have as the current that is flowing here, if I may call this as IS, all these things are going to be complex quantities. So IS, if I may call this as some angle phi, that is going to be equal to VS minus VR angle minus delta divided by J axis. This is going to be the current which is flowing through the transmission line or the intertie. 
uh, whatever is tying up uh, uh, the two sources together. So this is going to be the current through the tie line. Whatever is the tie line which is connecting the sending end voltage and receiving end voltage. Now I can write this as IS multiplied by cos phi plus J sin phi. So if I try to expand this with the uh, Euler's uh, expression, this is going to be the kind of current we are going to have. And we all know that the real power transferred to the receiving end or transferred to VR from VS. That we are going to call this as VS IS cos phi because only the real component of current is going to play a role in exactly uh, determining what is the kind of real power that is being transferred from the sending end voltage. So this is going to be the real power transfer. So from here, I should be able to say whatever is the real component of the current only that is going to play a role in determining what is the kind of real power transfer that is taking place between Vs and Vr. So I can write this particular expression. If I try to write this, I should say Vs divided by J excess, which is going to have only the imaginary component. There is no real component. And VR angle minus delta, I should be able to write this as VR multiplied by cos delta minus J sin delta. And this has to be divided by JX, J excess. This is going to be IS as far as the overall expression is concerned. Very clearly, this portion will have only imaginary component. And even this portion will have only imaginary component. So the real component is going to be contributed only by this particular component, which is VR times J sine delta divided by J excess. So from here, I should be able to write the IS cos phi S will be corresponding to VR sine delta divided by excess because this J and this J, they will get cancelled with each other. So I'm going to have VR sine delta divided by excess. So I can say IS cos phi, which is corresponding to the real component of current flowing through the tie line. That is going to be equal to VR times sine delta divided by excess. So I should be able to write that the overall real power transferred from Vs to VR that is sending end to receiving end that is going to be Vs multiplied by IS cos phi and IS cos phi already we have determined that to be VR times sine delta by excess. So this is going to be Vs VR divided by excess sine uh, times sine delta. So the phase angle delta which is actually existing between Vs and Vr determines what is the power apart from the magnitudes of Vs, Vr and Xs. All three of them are going to play a vital role. So if Vs is leading Vr, then power flows from Vs to Vr, whereas if Vs is lagging Vr, then power flows 
from VR to VS. So in AC uh, power system, the magnitudes of the voltages do not matter so much, but the phase angle matters quite a bit. If the phase angle is going to be positive, whichever is the leading voltage from the leading voltage, the power is going to flow towards the lagging voltage. So this happens depending upon the phase angle that is existing between the two voltages that we are talking about at the two ends of the tie line. Now, this is going to play a vital role in determining the control of the power flow in a dual active bridge. So now that we have understood how the power flow takes place between two AC sources, now let us try to uh, go towards the explanation or analysis of dual active bridge. So let us first of all draw the circuit diagram of a dual active bridge converter. So I'm just going to introduce dual active bridge. There are various types of control techniques, but I'm going to look at only one type of control technique in a dual active bridge. So a dual active bridge consists of, let us say, a source, DC source sitting on one side, which I'm calling as VS. Then I'm going to have a full bridge converter, which can work as an inverter or a rectifier. So I'm going to show four switches. Each of these switches will be consisting of a MOSFET or IGBT with anti-parallel diode, the regular inverter type of component. So I'm going to have these kinds of four switches connected together. So here, if I look at each of the switch, each switch is going to be equal to maybe an IGBT or a MOSFET. And along with that, I'm going to have a diode which is connected in anti-parallel. So this is going to be the switch configuration that I'm going to have. So if I may call this a switch, so this is the equivalent circuit, or uh, this is a representation of the switch, whereas this is going to be the actual component that is describing the switch. Okay. Now, uh, this is one bridge and I'm going to have a transformer, high frequency transformer connected here. So I'm going to show, uh, let us say this is the high frequency transformer that is connected at the output of this bridge. And this is having a secondary on the other side. So this is the secondary of the transformer. Now I'm going to have another bridge, maybe the other bridge I'm showing like this. So I'm going to have one, two, and three, and four. So these are going to be the switches. And we are going to have again, either a battery to be charged, or I can have a load which is connected here. So I'm just going showing a load right now. So let us say this is a resistance or something. So we are going to have a, a sending end voltage, which is Vs, which is the source voltage. And this is the receiving end voltage, which is Vr, which is actually going to have plus here and minus here. Now, between these two, I'm going to have a reactance. Let me show this reactance. This could be the leakage reactance of the transformer itself, but I'm showing this as an external reactance connected, which is very similar to we just showed that there is going to be a source on one side and uh, 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 sending end voltage on one side and receiving end voltage on the other side. And in between, there is going to be a transmission line. So the transmission lines uh, reactance we showed as Xs. So this Lx is very similar to this Xx. So this is Vs and this is Vr. That's what we showed in the previous slide. So let me just uh, represent that transmission line reactance with the help of this Lx. Now I'm going to connect this to, let us say, this portion of uh, 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 the bridge, the receiving end bridge, and this is going to be the other connection that is being connected from the transformer. 
So, uh, so this is the source what I have. And this is going to be the inverter which is going to switch at high frequency. So let me show this as a high frequency inverter. And this is going to be the high frequency transformer. And this is the inductor or reactants. And this is going to rectify AC to DC. So this is going to be the AC to DC converter. And this is going to be the load. So let me call this as the load. This is the load. So let me call this switch as say S1. And this will be S2. And this will be S3. And this will be S4. So when S1 and S4 are connected together or they are conducting, at that point, I'm going to have this point A, if I may call this as P and this point as Q, P is going to be positive and Q is going to be negative. Whereas when S3 and S2 are conducting, it will be exactly the opposite. You are going to have a, a Q as positive and P as negative. So that is the reason why you, we get AC across this. P and Q will be alternately Alternately, it will be positive and negative with respect to each other. That is the reason why we are getting AC voltage induced in the transformer or applied to the transformer. So this particular voltage, what I see at this point will be reflected based on whether S1, S4 are conducting or S2, S3 are conducting. Whereas this particular voltage at this point is going to be determined. That is voltage at point A is determined by which devices are conducting and what is the magnitude of Vs and what is the kind of turns ratio we have. If I have N1 turns here and N2 turns here. So voltage at A will be equal to Vs multiplied by N1 n2 divided by n1 multiplied by um, uh, vs that's what we have written uh, if s1 and s4 are conducting whereas it is going to be equal to minus vs multiplied by n2 by n1 if it is the other way around. That is S2 and S3 are conducting. Right? Whereas if I am looking at this point B, depending upon if I say that uh, I'm going to have this as S11 and let me call this as S33. This will be S22 and this will be S44. So we are going to have the voltage at point B determined by what is the magnitude of VR and whether S11, S44 are conducting or S22, S33 are conducting. That is how it is going to be determined. Now, depending upon what is the kind of voltage appearing at points A and B, the current through LX will be determined because LX being a pure inductor, we are going to have LX uh, delta ILX by whatever is the time duration we are considering. That is going to be equal to whatever is the voltage across LX. So the rate of change of current within uh, the inductor, what is flowing through the inductor LX will depend upon what is the kind of voltage that is appearing across that inductance and the voltage across the inductance is in turn decided by the status of the switches S1, S2, S3, S4 as well as S11, S22, S33, S44. And that is the reason why the power flow could be controlled quite easily by controlling these switches. So now let us try to draw the waveforms of current and voltages uh, across the inductance and also henceforth we would be able to determine really what kind of current is flowing through the load and hence how much is the power that is delivered to the load. 
So let us say we are going to have S1, S4 fired for T by 2. Starting from time T equal to 0. And similarly, let us say S2 and S3 fired for the next t by 2, starting from t equal to t by 2. So for half a cycle, we are going to have S1 and S4 conducting. And for rest of the half of the cycle, S2 and S3 are going to conduct. So when S1 and S4 are conducting, we are going to have the current flowing like this through S1 and it is going to go through this transformer like this and it is going to return through S4 and come back to Vs. So the voltage appearing across this will be Vs and that is the reason we said that the voltage at point A will be Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1. So let me try to first of all plot. So let me try to plot at this juncture with respect to time. What is the voltage at point A? So voltage at point A. We are talking about this point A. So what is the voltage at point A? So if we are assuming that we are going to fire uh, S1 and S4 for T by 2 and then we are going to fire S2 and S3 for another T by 2. So we are repeating this again and again. So this is the kind of waveform we are going to have and we are going to have uh, this as Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 and this voltage on the negative side is going to be minus Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1. So this is the kind of uh, voltage we are going to get at the secondary side of the transformer and the left side of uh, the inductor LX. Now, if let us say we are firing S11, S44 and S33, S22 also in the same frequency as that of what we are doing for the primary bridge, the first bridge. So only thing is we are going to delay the firing of S11, S44 from S1, S4 by an angle uh, theta or I can say I'm going to just delay this, this uh, 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 firing of S11 and S44 is going to be delayed by certain uh, period, which is dt divided by 2. So that is the kind of delay we are going to have for all the, that is S1, between S1, S4 and S11, S44. Similarly, between S2, S3 and S22, S33. So this is going to be dt by 2. This is also going to be dt by 2. The same way this will also be delayed by dt divided by 2. So dt divided by 2 is going to be the time delay between firing of S1, S4, and S11, S44. That is the bridge on uh, the primary side of the transformer and the secondary side of the transformer. So if I try to look at what is the voltage that is going to come up here, when S11 and S44 are conducting, we are going to have VR, whatever is the load voltage that is going to be appearing exactly because this plus will be connected through S11 to this plus. So uh, the polarity will be the same as that of the positive of VR. So we are going to get VR as such. Whereas if I am going to have S33 and S22 conducting, 
we will have actually this minus is connected through S22 to this terminal. So it will become minus of VR. So we are going to have a voltage somewhat like this. If I say that VR is slightly lower than Vs times N2 divided by N1, I'm going to have actually this as uh, the kind of voltage that I'm going to have. So this is going to be the kind of voltage I'm going to have on V. So this is going to be VB. So this is VA. So let me erase this and say this is VA. So this is going to be VA. And this is the green color one is VB. Now, voltage across the inductance, VLX is going to be VA minus VB. That is going to be the voltage across inductance. So let me try to draw what is the voltage across inductance. So let me again draw this with respect to time. And let me try to draw these time uh, durations clearly. So this is uh, dt by 2. And this is going to be uh, half of the time period. This is again shifted by dt by 2. Now this is going to be the uh, full time period. Uh, that is one cycle is over at this point. So this is going to be uh, dt by 2 again, delayed by dt by 2. And this is the way it is going to be. Okay. Now this entire thing is T by 2. And again, this entire thing is going to be another T by 2. So, this is the way we are going to have each of the half periods. Now, uh, VA minus VB, if I try to look at it, during this interval from uh, 0 to DT by 2. I am going to have actually VA is Vs multiplied by N2 by N1. And uh, this uh, particular voltage, I should say the magnitude wise, this is going to be Vr, that is the receiving end voltage or load voltage, and this is going to be minus Vr. So we are going to have Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 minus minus Vr. So we are going to have actually uh, the summation of these two is going to appear as the total voltage, which is going to be Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr. So this is what is Vlx. Let me write this as uh, Vlx. So Vlx is going to be given by this green color waveform. Now, uh, if we look at from dt by 2 until uh, t by 2, uh, both Va and Vb are positive. So Vs multiplied by N2 by N1, from that I have to subtract Vr. So I'm going to have Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 minus Vr, which is probably going to be the magnitude during this particular duration. So this is going to be Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 minus Vr. This is going to be the magnitude. Whereas if you try to look at it from um, T by 2, so this is the T by 2 duration. So this is 0, this is dT by 2, this is T by 2. So this is going to be T by 2 plus dT by 2 and this is going to be T. Now this is going to be T plus dT by 2 and this is going to be 2T. Uh, 3T by 2. Sorry. 3T divided by 2. So this is how we are going to mark these time intervals. Now here from T by 2 to t by 2 plus dt by 2, we are going to have uh, Va 
uh, as negative, whereas VB is going to be positive. VA is negative. So VA negative value is Vs multiplied by N2 by N1. That is minus and this is going to be minus Vr. So what we will have is the summation of two negative voltages which will actually show up as a large negative voltage for a for this duration. So this voltage what we get is going to be Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 plus Vr but minus of this entire thing. That is what is going to be the voltage at this juncture. Then we are going to have during this duration, it is very similar to what was happening between dt uh, over 2 and t over 2. The same thing is going to happen from this point until this point, but with a negative sign because Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 is the magnitude of the voltage at point A, but that is a larger negative magnitude and this is going to be a smaller negative magnitude. So overall, uh, the uh, when you uh, subtract one from the other, we are going to get Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 minus Vr but the negative of this is going to appear as the voltage here. So this is again going to repeat itself. After T, this will repeat itself. So again, you will have a voltage like this. And this is going to be the kind of voltage that will repeat itself again and again. So this is the kind of voltage that we are going to get across the inductance. So if this is the voltage across the inductance, this is the voltage across the inductance. We are talking about this inductance. So the current through an inductance, the rate of rise of current through an inductance is dependent upon the voltage across the inductance. So if I'm going to have a positive voltage, the current will rise. If I'm going to have a negative voltage, the current will fall. So this indicates a positive VLX and this indicates a negative VLX and this is going to be the current through LX. This is the way it is going to work. So if I have a very, very uh, large amount of voltage, positive voltage coming up across the inductance, that is going to cause a very, very high rate of rise. Similarly, if I'm going to have a lower value of positive voltage across the inductance, then that is going to actually make the rate of rise less. And if there is a large negative voltage across the inductance, it will make uh, the rate of rise, rate of fall of the inductance current quite large. So, because this entire thing is repeating itself, and the inductance cannot hold on to any energy uh, over one cycle period. Uh, what is the kind of current value it is reaching at the end of one cycle should be the same as whatever was the current that was there at the beginning of that cycle. OK, so what I mean is whatever was the current here, the same should be the current at the end of one cycle, which is this. So we are going to have cycle after cycle, the current is going to reach the same value. Now here the current is really going to go quite high. So if I assume that the current was probably starting from some value, which I'm going to call as something like, uh, um, let me call one of the values as some I2 and the other one value as I1. So this is minus I2 and this is going to be minus I1. Similarly, let me draw on the other side. This is going to be plus I1 and this value is going to be plus I2. So one is on the negative side, the other one is on the positive side. So when I'm going to see that uh, the 
current is actually reaching uh, or it is going to have a rate of rise because of the positive voltage. Maybe it will start from here and it will reach plus I1. So let me draw as though the current is reaching something like this. It is going to be a linear rise. So I will have a linear rise of current like this. After that, I'm having only a smaller voltage. So the rate of rise will be slower, but still the current will rise. So I'm showing as though the current is rising like this. So I'm going to have for DT duration, DT by 2 duration, the current is rising from minus I2 to plus I1. So for 0 to DT over 2 duration, ILX rises from minus I2 to plus I1. Okay. Now from T equal to DT divided by 2 to T over 2. Okay. So this is T over 2. So this is going to be 0. This is DT by 2. Whereas this is T by 2. Now this is going to be T by 2 plus DT by 2. Whereas this is going to be T. And this point is going to be T plus DT over 2. So from here to here it is going to rise to I2. So this is going to rise from I1 to I2. So ILX changes from I1 to I2. Now from here, this is plus I2 and this is a huge negative voltage. So from here, the current actually is going to come down linearly. So I should show it as though it is coming down linearly. So this is uh, the time axis that I have drawn. So I'm going to have the current coming down linearly during this portion. So this has to be something like a straight line. So this will come down like this. Now from here, so I should say from T equal to T by 2 to T by 2 plus DT by 2. For this duration, the inductance current is going to change from plus I2 to minus I1. So it has reached this value. From here, again, we are going to have an increase in the current, uh, which is in the negative direction, and this is going to reach minus I2. So this is the point where it becomes T. So this is the point where it becomes T. And this is actually T by 2. And this is going to be T by 2 plus DT by 2. So this has reached minus I2, then it will repeat itself. So I should show it as though from here it is going to again rise like this. And again it will go like this. And then from here it will come down like this. So this will repeat itself, you know. So this is going to be ILX. If I try to plot what is ILX, assuming LX is ideal inductance, this is the way it is going to be. We should be able to calculate the rate of rise and rate of fall and everything. That should not be a problem. We'll do that in a minute. Now, if this is ILX, this is ILX. So if ILX is this direction, if S1 and S44 are conducting, I'm going to have the load current which is flowing in this direction is same as that of ILX direction. Rather than that, if I'm going to have S22 and S33 conducting, although I call this as ILX, I am going to have actually the current what is flowing as ILX 
uh, that opposite to that should be the direction of current of the load current. Because if I'm looking at this as ILFs, uh, the current actually what is flowing through the load, if that is going to flow in the opposite direction, if S22 and S33 are conducting, I'm going to have the current flowing in the opposite direction when uh, uh, I compare the direction of current through ILX and the load current. So what I'm trying to get at is, if S22 and S33 are conducting, then I load equal to minus of ILX. But if S11 and S44 are conducting, then I load is equal to ILX itself. Both of them are going to be exactly equal to each other. So let us now try to take a look at this and try to draw how the uh, load current can be drawn uh, with respect to time. So let me extend this further. So if you look at it, uh, we said that uh, initially from 0 to T by 2, S1, S4 are conducting and uh, T by 2 to uh, T, S2, S3 are conducting. So whenever this blue positive is coming, we have S1, S4 and we are having S2, S3 here. Whereas whenever this green positive is there, we are going to have S11, S44 conducting. Whereas when the green negative is there, we are going to have S22 and S33 conducting. So let me clearly write that down. I can say from 0 to dt over 2, we are going to have S22, S33 conducting. Now dt over 2 to D divided by 2 plus dt over 2, we are going to have S11 and S44 conducting. And we are going to have from T by 2 plus dt over 2 to um, uh, the next one, that is T plus dt over 2. So that is again going to be S22, S33. So this is the kind of cycle we are going to have for converter 2. This is for the converter on the secondary side of the transformer. So this is going to be the converter switching on the secondary side of the transformer because we are having a delay of dt by 2. What we are having as the delay is dt by 2. So now if you look at it, uh, here we are going to have S22, S33 conducting as per this. S22, S33 conducting. So whatever we are having as the current, we should write, draw the opposite of that. So when we draw the opposite of that, uh, this is, let us say, I2. This is going to be I2 magnitude and this is going to be I1. The same way, let me draw uh, I1 here, minus I1 and minus I2. So we are going to have a current which is exactly opposite to that of this. So uh, I should have a current flowing from here and reaching I1. So something like this. I should have a current like this. Now. After that, so during this duration, we have S11 and S44 conducting and that will continue until here. 
right? Because it is from dt divide dt over two to t by two uh, plus dt over two. So here the current has to come up as it is. So I have to just abruptly show a change in the current, which is actually happening through the load. So the current will go like this, and uh, I should show as though the current is abruptly going until this I1 from minus I1 to plus I1, and then it is going to increase like this to I2, and it will come down again uh, until this point, that is uh, I1. So I, it is going to come down to I1 like this. So uh, again, if you look at it here, we are going to have S22 and S 3, 3 conduct because S22 and S33 are conducting until here. I should have actually the reverse of so abruptly this has to again jump up like this. And again, this should be I1 and it should go up till I2 like this. And uh, whatever is the current here, it should be the opposite of this. So uh, from here, it is going to come down like this. So this is the kind of current we are going to have. So this has to be uh, drawn again and again and again, and this is going to be uh, the load current basically. So this is the load current what we are looking at. So the load current we have drawn based on what is the current through LX. And along with the current through LX, we are also looking at which are the devices which are conducting in the bridge in the secondary side. So if S11 and S44 are conducting, we are translating ILX as it is, whereas if S22 and S33 are conducting, we are actually uh, drawing the reverse of ILX. So this is going to be the load current. So if this is the load current, uh, if we say that the current versus time plot integrated over time or over T by two for half a cycle, if we integrate this and this and the integral is divided by T by two. And if we are able to divide this integral uh, is divided oh, uh, by T over two, then that should give me what is I load average. So what I mean is if I may call this area, whatever I have got here as A1, if I call this area as A2, so this area is A2, this area is A1, and I'm going to call this area until here as A3. So this is essentially the total amount of area occupied by the current versus time curve. So I should say A1 plus A3 minus A2 should give us uh, what is the integral of current over t by 2. So this should give us the overall integral uh, of the current over t by 2. So now let us try to calculate this area. So I'm going to uh, uh, remove these things and then now I'm going to do the calculation for uh, this areas A1, A2 and A3. Now, if I may call this particular uh, duration, this duration as some T1. OK, so what is T1? I have to first of all calculate T1, but area A1 will be equal to area A1 will be equal to half 
uh, it's a triangle and the base is T1 half BH and the height is I2. I'll have to calculate what is T1. There is no doubt. And area A2 is going to be equal to again. Uh, this is also a triangle. All of them are actually right angle triangle. I have not drawn it very clearly, but it is going to reach here and this is going to be an abrupt rise. So area A2 is again going to be half multiplied by this entire thing was dt over 2. And this duration is t1. So this is going to be dt over 2 minus t1. That is going to be the duration. And uh, 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 maximum current value is i1. OK, so that is going to be area A2. And area A3, if I try to get Area A3 is going to be equal to that is half. Uh, this is actually consisting of two portions. One portion corresponds to a triangle. And that triangle is this much. This is the triangle portion. And the other portion corresponds to a rectangle. So that rectangle corresponds to this. From here, this side, this side. And this side, this is the rectangle. So this is area of the rectangle will be whatever is the time duration T by 2 minus DT by 2. This is going to be the rectangle's uh, 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 x-axis or time axis. And the height is going to be I1. So this is the area of the rectangle. Now on the top of that, I have to add the triangle area also. Triangle again is going to have the base or uh, half BH. If I try to say base is going to be T by 2 minus DT by 2. So let me write this as uh, plus half uh, T by 2 multiplied by 1 minus d. So that is the duration what I have got. And uh, the height is going to be i2 minus i1. So this is what is the area A3. Now T1, how would we calculate? T1 can be calculated based on if I know what is the voltage which is causing the rate of rise of or rate of fall of current that we had already calculated the voltage what causes the rate of rise of current is Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 plus Vr. So I should say uh, rate of rise of current. from 0 to dt over 2. So that is actually caused by, I can write Lx multiplied by delta Ilx, whatever is the variation in the current or increase in the current. That will be equal to Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr multiplied by whatever is the time duration. The time duration is dt over 2. That is the time duration. So I can say that T1 corresponds to this time T1 corresponds to where the current is reaching 0 from I2. So from I2 to 0, it reaches in T1. So in this particular case, I should be able to say um, Lx multiplied by delta Ilx. Delta Ilx is I2 minus 0. So that is going to be I2 itself is equal to Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr multiplied by T1. So T1 can be calculated as 
L X times I two divided by V S times N two by N one plus V R. So T one we can get the value directly from this particular equation. We should be able to get the value of T one. Okay. So let us try to write this clearly. So area A one is going to be equal to half L X. I two square because I two multiplied by I two uh, because we are substituting for T one divided by V S N two over N one plus B R. So this is A one. Similarly, A three, uh, A two. Let us try to write. Um, If we look at the voltage during uh, this current I one, that is uh, when uh, it is rising from I one to I two, the voltage is V S multiplied by N two divided by N one minus V R. So let us again try to write that. So uh, when the current is Rising from I one to I two in the duration t a uh, dt over two to t over two. This is the duration when it is rising from this value to this particular value. So I should write L X. Multiplied by I two minus I one. That is the kind of uh, variation that is happening. Is equal to um, um, the voltage that is available is V S multiplied by N two over N one minus V R. This is the voltage available, and the time duration is T by two minus dt by 2 so that is 1 minus d multiplied by t over 2 so this is the kind of uh, um uh, slope we are having during the duration of dt over 2 to t over 2 so area a2 corresponds to uh, not really that duration area a2 corresponds to still dt over 2 duration only so the slope itself is the same only thing is the current is changing from 0 to i1 okay so this particular slope when we are talking about uh, this particular uh, slope this corresponds to actually area a3 not really area a2 so we don't have to worry too much about it so let us first of all try to write this area a2 the slope is now corresponding to 0 to i1 current rises from from t1 to from uh, duration t1 if when we talk about duration t1 to dt over 2 the current is rising from 0 to i1 so for that let us try to write from t1 to dt over 2 current rises from 0 to i1 or varies from 0 to i1 so because of which we should write again um half i should be able to write this particular thing that is lx Times I one is equal to V S multiplied by N two over N one plus V R multiplied by whatever is the time duration that is D T over two minus T one. That is what it is. D T over two minus T one. Okay. 
So, and for T1, we have got already this particular expression. So, we should be able to write this as half TT over 2 minus T1 multiplied by I1. Right? So, dt over 2 minus t1 will be lx i1 divided by vs uh, uh, multiplied by n2 divided by n1 plus vr. So, we are going to use this portion and then substitute that here. That is half multiplied by lx i1. i1 into i1 and it will be i1 square divided by vs n2 over n1 plus vr. So we are basically deriving what is area a1, what is area a2. And the last area which is corresponding to uh, this area a3, which is t by 2 minus dt by 2 multiplied by i1 plus half uh, t by 2 multiplied by 1 minus d, i2 minus i1. So let us now try to uh, put that together. So uh, these are a1, which is half lx divided by vs n2 divided by n1 plus vr. This is a1. And a2 is the same thing but with i1 square. So we have to write i2 square minus i1 square. This will be a1 minus a2. So this is what is a1 minus a2. Okay. Now we should also be able to write a3. a3 corresponds to, we wrote this already, t over 2 multiplied by 1 minus d multiplied by i1 plus uh, t over 2 multiplied by 1 minus d multiplied by i2 minus i1 divided by 2. Okay. So we should be able to take this t over 2 multiplied by 1 minus d as a common factor. And this is i1. Uh, this is i1 minus uh, i1 by 2. So that will be i1 itself, i1 by 2 itself. So i1 plus i2 divided by 2. So this is what we are getting as a3. So overall, when we talk about A1 plus A2, A3 minus A2 divided by T by 2 is the average load current. So that we should be able to get as, um, this is half LX, so it has to be divided by T by 2. So I can write 2 by T times, uh, um, half Lx divided by Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr. And this we should be able to write I2 plus I1 multiplied by I2 minus I1. A square minus B square. A plus B multiplied by A minus B. And the last one, I should be able to write this as, I have to multiply again this by 2 by t. So uh, this t by 2 and t by 2, they will get cancelled. So I should be able to write this as 1 minus d uh, multiplied by i1 plus i2 divided by 2. Okay. Now we should be able to get the expression for i2, i1, or I2 plus I1 as well as I2 minus I1 because we know the voltages uh, from uh, in the initial duration, the current was rising from minus I2 to 
plus I1. So I should be able to say during this duration, the total delta uh, ILX will be I2 plus I1. So I, if I say LX delta ILX by DT by 2 is equal to uh, this voltage VLX. Okay, so if I try to write for this particular duration, I should be able to write this as for 0 to dt by 2 duration, current rises from minus i2 to plus i1. So delta ILX will be i1 minus minus I2. So that will be I1 plus I2. So I should be able to write this as LX multiplied by I1 plus I2 equal to whatever is the voltage, which is Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 plus Vr multiplied by dt by 2. So we can get an expression for I1 plus I2 without any difficulty. The same way we should be able to get an expression for the rise in the current is from I2 to I1 to I2 during this particular portion. So we should be able to get an expression for I2 minus I1 during this portion. So we can say for dt over 2 to t over 2, current rises from I1 to I2. So delta ILX will be I2 minus I1. So I can write again LX multiplied by I2 minus I1 equal to Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 minus Vr. That has to be multiplied by uh, uh, T by 2 minus dT by 2. So T by 2 multiplied by 1 minus T. So if you look at expression for I1, plus I2, we should be able to derive it in terms of the source voltage, the turns ratio, the inductance value, the resistance load voltage, and D. The same way I2 minus I1 also can be derived in terms of the source voltage, the turns ratio, the resistance voltage, and 1 minus D. So, in general, if you are looking at I2 plus I1 or I2 minus I1, that is also a function of the voltages and the duty ratio. So if we substitute this, let me try to maybe substitute this. This particular I1 plus I2 is this and I1 minus I2 is this. So let us try to substitute that. I1 plus I2 we are getting as um, Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 plus Vr dt by 2 divided by Lx. So I1 plus I2 equal to Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 plus Vr multiplied by dt by 2 Lx. The same way I2 minus I1 we are getting as Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 minus Vr multiplied by 1 minus D, D divided by 2Lx. Okay. 1 minus D, D by 2Lx. Okay. Now, can we substitute this? This is, let us say, equation number one, equation number two. Now, substituting these in this particular thing, 
thing, we should be able to write this as uh, 2 and 2 will get cancelled. So I can write LX divided by T multiplied by uh, VS N2 divided by N1 plus VR. So this has come up as the first portion. I2 plus I1 is uh, Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr multiplied by Dt divided by 2Lx. So again, I should be able to cancel this Lx with this Lx, this T with this T, and this with this. We are yet to put only I2 minus I1. So I2 minus I1 will come out to be, I2 minus I1 will come out to be Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 minus Vr multiplied by 1 minus D times T divided by 2Lx. Okay, so this is uh, this particular I2 minus I1. So from here, if you look at it, only D by 2 was remaining. So D multiplied by 1 minus D times T by 2, Vs multiplied by N2 by N1 minus Vr divided by 2Lx. This is what is remaining as the expression corresponding to this. Now, this has to be added to now 1 minus D times I1 plus I2 by 2. I1 plus I2 by 2 is Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 plus Vr uh, dt divided by, because there is 1 divided by 2 here also, 4Lx. So, this happens to be the average current. So, I load average comes out to be Vs multiplied by N2 divided by N1 minus Vr multiplied by D1 minus D D divided by 4Lx plus Again, D1 minus D, T divided by 4Lx, this is common factor, multiplied by Vs, Ns by N1 plus Vr, rather N2 by N1 plus Vr. So, this is the average load current. Again, you can manipulate further if we uh, actually add these two. This is a common factor. So minus Vr and plus uh, yeah, so this will be the common factor and we have to take these two into consideration. So minus Vr and plus Vr will get cancelled with each other hopefully. So we will get D multiplied by 1 minus D T divided by 4 Lx multiplied by Vs N2 by N1. And this, this will appear two times. So this will, uh, there will be a two here. And this Vr, minus Vr and plus Vr will get cancelled. So we are going to have two Lx at the bottom. When uh, we cancel these two, we will have only two Lx at the bottom. This is the I load average. So power delivered to the load is going to be equal to Vr, whatever is the voltage across the load. Either we can say that or we should be able to say this I load square multiplied by the resistance. If I assume it is a resistive load or I should say Vr multiplied by I load. So V R. If I uh, if I just say this is D 
1 minus d uh, vs and n2 divided by n1 divided by 2f, whatever is the frequency at which this particular converter is being switched, this has to be multiplied by vr. So this is going to be the power delivered to the load. So the bottom line is, we should be able to adjust the amount of power being delivered based on uh, the adjustment of D. That is how long I am delaying uh, the second converter firing or the secondary side converter firing as compared to the primary side converter. That should be able to give us very clearly adjustment of power being delivered to the load. So the dual active bridge, control of dual active bridge, the power control of dual active bridge can be effectively accomplished either by controlling what is the duty ratio or delay of converter to firing as compared to converter one firing. There are other methods of control as well. Uh, we should be able to control for how long? Right now, whatever we analyzed, we analyzed with 50% duty ratio. That is, we are going to have S1 and S4 on for 50% of the duration and S2 and S3 on for 50% of the duration. That's what we did. But we need not do that. We can only fire it for a shorter duration than 50% of duration. So we can even control it based on uh, controlling the duration for which bridge one and bridge two are fired. They need not be fired for T by 2 uh, during positive half cycle and T by 2 during negative half cycle. They can be fired only for fraction of this duration. It's not a big problem. If we are able to fire it only for a fraction of this duration, then correspondingly, we are going to get the average value of voltage what is appearing across the transformer winding on the primary side or secondary side that is going to diminish. Then correspondingly, we will have a difference between the primary volt side voltage and the secondary side voltage will also vary. Then correspondingly, the current that is flowing through the inductance LX will vary. So all these things will definitely affect the amount of power being transferred. So the major advantages of dual active bridge converter are the first and foremost thing is it will allow bidirectional power flow because depending upon which side voltage is leading, secondary side voltage is leading or primary side voltage is leading, depending upon that, the power flow can be from the primary side to secondary side and vice versa. So it will allow bidirectional power flow, which means if I am going to have a battery which is installed probably in a, a grid or something like that, the power can flow from the grid into the battery, that is battery can get charged or from the battery, the power can flow into the grid if uh, the grid is probably having some difficulty or shortfall of power, it can happen. So it will allow bidirectional power flow. 
The second thing is we are going to have a huge flexibility of control. Because it can be uh, um, having the flexibility of either turning on the switch for entire 50% of the cycle duration, or you can turn it on only for a shorter duration. You can have, in fact, 40% uh, on the primary side and maybe 30% on the secondary side and whatever. So we would be able to really control in different ways uh, the power flow either by changing the phase shift between the primary and secondary side converter or even by uh, 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 turning on the devices for less than T by 2 duration on the primary side or for a different duration on the secondary side. So we would be able to get a good flexibility of control. The third thing is we are using high frequency transformer generally in dual active bridge. And whenever we are using high frequency transformer, size can be reduced drastically. So in a high frequency transformer, size is reduced drastically. Why? That is because if you look at any, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at Faraday's law, n d phi by dt is equal to voltage. So in general, we can say the voltage is proportional to the number of turns, of course, the flux and time comes at the bottom, which means it is also proportional to frequency. So we are going to have the voltage at which the transformer is operating that is proportional to the product of flux and frequency. So if we are talking about a particular voltage, let us say we are talking about 240 volts. And we are operating at one Weber of flux. OK, and if we are talking about 50 Hertz transformer, then we might have to increase the number of uh, turns correspondingly. OK, so if we are uh, talking about a 50 Hertz transformer working at one Weber, we might like to have about five turns. If we are talking about the same 240 volts or 250 volts transformer, but if we are uh, talking about again the same five number of turns, but if we are working with 5000 Hertz, which is actually 100 times the original frequency what we have got here. In that case, the flux could be 1 by 100 Weber. So correspondingly, the flux can decrease enormously when we increase the frequency. If the flux decreases, that means we can, uh, for the same flux density, the area can be minimized. So if flux decreases for the same material where the flux density is already fixed for every material, what is the kind of flux density it can handle? So B is fixed, flux density is fixed, then area can be decreased. Area of cross section that can be decreased. So the core area, if the core area can be decreased, the area of cross section is decreased, that means the transformer will be miniaturized. So cross sectional area decreases. So the transformer can be miniaturized. That is the reason why in many of the SMPS circuits, what you see inside the uh, personal computer, PC, uh, we use generally very high frequency transformer, so the size can be miniaturized. It can become much smaller as compared to the normal power supplies, what you see that are being used in the laboratory. This is one reason why many of the aerospace electronic systems 
they all used again 400 hertz or 500 hertz machines rather than 50 hertz machines which we use on the land when we look at any of the uh, machines that we use in uh, most of the industries all of them work in 50 hertz or 60 hertz in usa and canada they work on 60 hertz in india they work on 50 hertz so generally you are going to see that uh, uh, the frequency at which our machines operate in industries they are all 50 or 60 hertz but in aerospace electronic systems generally we want to minimize the space so aerospace electronic systems generally all the electrical machines that are used there will work in 400 hertz or 500 hertz so in that sense dual active bridge also which uses high frequency transformer generally can be of very very small size that is one more advantage uh, as compared to many other dc to dc converters which are non isolated to uh, topologies so dual active bridge has a lot of advantages that's one reason why it is being used extensively in many of the battery charging applications